Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending July 5th. This first story is from a website called Design and Trend. Some of you that know me know that I love spiders. I won't kill spiders if they're in the house and they're disturbing somebody. I'll take them to the crawl space or take them outside if it's not winter time. But the Natural History Museum is giving spiders a new spin with a live exhibit. So for those of you that have a fear of spiders, uh, maybe you wouldn't like the exhibit quite so much, but maybe it would help you get over your fear of spiders. They're going to feature 20 species of live arachnids, including 16 spider species and two scorpion species. Uh, For those of you that don't know, the Natural History Museum is in Washington, D.C., so if you're in that area, and this is going to be running through November 2nd, so it's going to be around for quite a while if you want the opportunity to see that. And to me especially, I would like to see they have some fossil species of spiders in amber, so that would be kind of cool to see them. Um, uh, This is some of the quotes from Dr. Platnick, who is the... uh, is hosting this exhibit. Some of our visitors are likely to arrive with some fear of spiders, but the reality is that in most cases spiders pose no threat to people. For 45 years I've been studying spiders and have never been bitten. Same with me. I have handled spiders, had them crawl on me, picked them up in my hands. As long as you don't try to crush them or they don't think they're being harmed, I think the chances are very slim that you're going to be bitten by spiders. I mean, I've been stung plenty of times by bees and wasps, but uh, spiders have never actually given me any kind of problem. So if you do get a chance and you're anywhere near the Natural History Museum, I guess the whole collection of this thing is like there's millions of them. So if you were to try to see the whole collection, it would take you, as he said, six lifetimes to examine the entire collection of spiders in the Natural History Museum. But I tell you what, I would sure like, uh, if I had the time and the money to go there, I would sure like making a a stab at seeing a lot of them. And next up, this is from Science Recorder, and this is something I've talked about many times in the past. That's about the uh, planet they thought they found in 2010, uh, Gliese 581g. Well, if you know how planet finding is, it's actually more statistical analysis than it is looking through a telescope and actually seeing a planet. Most planets, that's there's so few photons you get from their accompanying star that you're looking for slight changes in the photons or the uh, spectrograph of the way the star is wobbling, things like that. So a lot of times if you misinterpret data, you can actually see things that aren't there. And evidently now that they've had other people test and done additional studies on this and uh, The findings are just contradicting the data of the original people that found the planet. So it looks like the uh, planet was just a statistical anomaly. In fact, the two planets, there were two planets that were uh, uh, Gliese 581d and Gliese 581g. And now it looks like it was just a matter of a misinterpretation of the statistics. So, uh, yeah, that's one thing when you're on the cutting edge of something and trying to find something just by, uh, you know, statistical variation and stuff like that. Um, any any kind of errors introduced or anything like that can get you to thinking that something exists that doesn't or something doesn't exist that does. So if you get a chance, um, check that out. I'm hoping in the future they will get better at it, uh, detecting, you know, like anything else. The more you do it, the, more, the better you get at it. But when you're on the cutting edge and stuff like that, this, these things are to be expected. So, uh, yeah, kind of unusual. That's something I've probably done at least two, if not three, TDD reports on. Um, doesn't even exist, but you know, in science that happens. This next one's from newsmain.net. Plants can hear and respond to threats produced by leaf munching insects. I've always, since I did high school science, I was always interested in the fact that I myself had an idea that maybe plants are a little bit more intelligent than people give them credit for, and they can sense a lot more things than we uh, think they can. Well, evidently, there are some plants related to cabbage that can hear the sound. Actually, I don't know if it's here like human hearing they're talking about, but I think it's more like sense the sounds of the vibration of this particular caterpillar that's munching on it, and then it produces this kind of a toxic substance to where the uh, it kind of discourages these caterpillars from eating on them. And just to do a test, they got a, a, a member... Uh, a plant member related to the cabbage family, and they recorded the vibration, vibrations of the munching caterpillar. And what they did was they took two other sets of plants, and instead of having the caterpillars munch on them with one set of plants, they just played the sounds so that the plants would be close enough to be able to sense the vibration of the sounds of the munching caterpillars. And then to another set of uh, plants, they did nothing, and there was a difference in this toxic chemical that was produced by the plants that actually were played the sound uh, 
the other thing about it too is they also to uh, compensate for the fact that these plants might just do it in the results of just any kind of vibration they also reproduce the vibration of just gentle breezes and the wind and stuff like that and that didn't seem to have them produce this kind of toxic substance or anything uh, it's called mustard oil that's what they do in response the plants emit mustard oil to prevent consumption we found that feeding vibration signal changes in the plant cells metabolism creating more defensive chemicals that can repel attacks from caterpillars head scientist Heidi Appel so that's kind of cool I think more and more we study it the more we're going to think that plants are uh, um, have a lot more intelligence and a lot more uh, ability to do things than we thought in the we thought in the past and this last one is from IFL Science. Measles outbreak traced back to a single unvaccinated child. I posted this in the TDD report Facebook page, the Facebook group. So if you get a chance, um, I would encourage you to uh, join the Facebook group if you're part of Facebook because it's very interesting. There's a variety of people that post all kinds of cool science, technology, and gadget type of stuff. But uh, I'll just read a little bit from this article. To add to the ever-growing list of examples that highlight the necessity of vaccination, a new study published in Pediatrics has demonstrated that the source of the 2011 outbreak of measles in Minnesota was an unvaccinated child that contracted the infection while visiting Kenya. So if you... These people that actually are anti-vaccine, I just do not understand them at all. I mean, if you expect something to be perfect and have no side effects whatsoever, but the ideas especially the ideas that vaccines produce autism it's just there's no statistical validity I mean you're gonna have 10,000 kids get any kind of shot not even a vaccine and a few of those kids are later going to be diagnosed to be autistic but it does not mean there's a cause and effect because something happens does not mean it caused the next thing that happened it's like saying that a kid brushed their teeth and then three years later got cancer so brushing their teeth caused cancer it just does not hold up to statistics and yes, I realize the fact that even with polio vaccines, as good as they were, and even with smallpox vaccines, there are going to be a very, very small percentage of people that just have a horrible reaction to it and maybe even die from it. But all in all, I still think vaccines are one of the best medical breakthroughs we've ever come across, and it makes me very upset with these anti-vaccine people of saying, well, and especially the ones that say, well, I don't need to vaccine my kid because all the rest of the kids are vaccinated. Well, if everybody has that idea, pretty soon none of the kids end up vaccinated and everybody starts getting sick and diseases start spreading again. So if you want to see this, especially the other thing that's happening more and more in the Midwest area is whooping cough is breaking out too. So I would encourage you, if you're, especially if your pediatrician suggests it and uh, your kid doesn't have any indications against it, please get all of the vaccines that you possibly can because it, it may save not just your kid's life but a lot of other kids' lives. Um, so anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I will catch you next week.